and sing, this is your I'm 
freedom in Christ. And uh, I want to uh, just share a couple of things that I found with you regarding freedom in Christ. We can go ahead and put that first uh, screen up there, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to be going uh, at even further than verse 30. We won't be going verse by verse. But it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I don't normally do this, but if I could just take a moment. and Aren't those some wonderful backgrounds that they find to put up there? Those messages, they're always timely and very beautiful. And thank Wayne. And I don't know if Connie gave him some of those too. I don't know who found them, but Wayne does a great job finding those, and we, we really appreciate it. There's a lot of Christians today that are not enjoying freedom in Christ. They're in bondage to a number of things. And I'm not going to go down a long list of things. People, Satan can make a bondage out of anything. He can make a bondage out of something natural. He can make a bondage out of something religious. He can make a bondage out of a relationship. He can make bondage out of anything. But uh, when I think about having freedom in Christ, and over the next two Sundays, you're going to see how this is borne out in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 7 talks about someone who tries to serve God under the law. And what a failure that is. There's no way possible that we can serve God under the law. But when, when I think about what we as Americans enjoy when it comes to freedom, I don't think we even know what kind of a price was paid. Sometimes it's just so easy for us to forget or not to even know, never have known, some of the price that was paid. And I've got several things in my pocket here I'd like to get... Uh, my old spectacles out. Some of this printout is uh, pretty small print. But I just wanted to read a little bit of this to you this morning. Those who signed the Declaration of Independence. 56 men. Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons serving in the Revolutionary Army and another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. But yet they signed and they pledged their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were these men? 24 were lawyers, 11 were merchants, 9 were farmers, and large plantation owners, men of means, well educated. But they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Just to give you a, a little, little taste of just a, a few of these, Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy plantation and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts, and he died a homeless man. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay. Could we get any of our congressmen and senators to do that today? And his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and he died in poverty. Vandals or soldiers looted the properties of Dillery, Hall, Clymer, Walton, Winnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. And at the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr., Jr. one of the signers, noted that General Cornwallis had taken up residence in his home. And he quietly went to General Washington and he said, please open fire on my house. His house was open fire upon and ultimately destroyed. John Hart, this is interesting, was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and his gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year he lived in forests and caves. Returning home to find his wife dead, and his children gone, he never saw one of them again. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. And these men did all of this for human freedom. But what did Jesus do 
So you and I could have the greatest freedom that anyone needs. The freedom from sin. Amen. Freedom to love, to relate to, to get to know better, to live for Christ. So with that in mind, I, I just want to kind of go down. This is a bit of a bit of an expository message this morning that I want to share with you. But it's found in verse or chapter 8 of, of Romans. Again, remembering our verse, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What kind of freedom does Jesus offer us here? There's four types of freedom, and we're only going to deal with two of them today. The first freedom that I see in Romans chapter 8 is a freedom from judgment. A freedom from judgment. Because it's the law of God, as we've been studying for the last nine weeks, uh, on the way of the Master on Sunday nights. The thing that people have to realize before they can ever understand freedom in Christ is that they are under the penalty of God's moral law. And uh, again, I want to challenge you to take what you have learned over the last nine weeks and to use it to show somebody the error of their way so that they can truly experience and enjoy the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God, God through Jesus Christ offers us, first of all, a freedom from judgment. And the judgment, of course, we know will come from God's law. The first thing I want you to notice about this freedom from judgment is that the law cannot claim you. Because if you look in verse 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? It is God's holiness God's moral law. It is the Ten Commandments. Now, some people have a tendency to say, well, you know, the law was something evil and Jesus came and He just got rid of it. No, 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 no. The law is not evil. The law is God's holiness. It is God's perfection. It is God's righteousness. And it is a standard that we as God's people are called to live up to. But we know that we cannot live up to it in our own strength, don't we? Whenever you see the universal symbol of the cross, and you, you see it hanging around the neck, you see it on a bumper sticker, you see it on hillsides on the interstate, because the cross represents God's love reaching out when you see the, 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 the uh, beam this way, and then when you see the vertical beam going up, that stands for God's holiness. That which points up to the righteousness and the holiness of God. And it was fulfilled by the love of Jesus Christ and the punishment that He received. So you and I could experience freedom. And because of this freedom we have in Christ, the law can no longer claim us. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has now made us free from that. Praise God. Amen. There's a misnomer. To this and Satan loves it but I remember talking to a lady a long time ago and uh, she was talking about all the terrible things she had done that week and I mean some of them were pretty bad and I remember looking at her and said how can you call yourself a Christian and do things that the scripture and the word of God says you shouldn't do she said oh it's simple it's simple I can still see her hands in the air <clears throat> she said I am a Christian. I'm no longer under law. I'm under grace, so I can do. So I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. So I just live my life the way I want to. Well, she had a miscon. She had a misconception about what what grace is all about. What happens is the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to maintain and and obey the moral law of God. Cannot do it in ourselves. But thank God. The person who's out there this morning who, who, who does not know the Lord and, and, and who is under the penalty of God's moral law, the law claims them this morning. But you and I have been set free from that claim by the law of life found in Jesus Christ. The law can't claim you. But then I want you to notice something else. The law cannot condemn you. 
Because if you'll notice in verse 3, he says, For what the law could not do, and we skip down a little bit, God did by sending His own Son. He condemned sin in the flesh. You know, one of the things we need to understand is that we in the flesh were created by God to live a perfect life. But no man has ever done that, has he? But when Jesus Christ came to earth, He was fully God, and yet He was fully man. And it says that He lived His life here, but yet He was without sin. He satisfied the law of God in the flesh. You and I can't do that. And we haven't done it. We've had to say, I'm sorry. We've had to repent. We've had to confess to God. But Jesus Christ satisfied God's justice and God's righteous requirement. And because of that, He set us free from the condemnation that is found in the law of God. He condemned sin in the flesh. He said, sin will no longer have dominion over those whom I have bought back. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for freedom from judgment this morning? But then I want you to notice that the law not only cannot condemn you, but thank God the law cannot control you as a child of God. Because verse 4 says this, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What do we mean by the law cannot control you? We simply mean that we do not have to live in fear of its bondage because we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are given strength and power to live according to God's law. What a frustrating situation it is in Romans chapter 7 when you read the Apostle Paul and he says, I want to do good things, but then I do evil. When I find that the, that the Spirit of God, uh, I, I inside I want to do God's will, but my flesh does my will. What was he doing? He was trying to serve, the law, serve God under the law as a Pharisee. And he found that he could not keep the law. Even Jesus told the Pharisees, He said, you do not keep the law. And they were the ones who were the teachers of it. He said, you're blind leaders of the blind. You're, you're, you're blind teachers. And he said, what happens? You both fall in the ditch. What are we talking about this morning? We're talking about freedom in Christ. You know, the law of God is good. It's not unholy. It's the righteousness of God. But without Jesus Christ and what He did for us, it would control us, every aspect of us, because we're bound under it. The righteous requirement of the law now, instead of controlling us, is fulfilled in us. Just as it was fulfilled in Jesus. Because we have Him within us. We have His Holy Spirit within us. He enables us to live in freedom to do God's law. God doesn't free us from His law. He frees us to do His law and to obey His law. Not only do we have freedom from judgment, but we have freedom from defeat. Verse 12 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. You know, this concept that, you know, there's nothing I can do. I just, I am who I am. I live in this body. And, you know, I'm just kind of a slave to it. This scripture says, not as a child of God, you're no longer in debt to that. You're no longer in bondage to the flesh. You're a bond slave of Jesus Christ. You obey Him by His power. You don't obey the flesh anymore. You obey the Spirit who enables you to have freedom from defeat. Now Paul goes on to describe three levels of living here. And I find these very, very interesting. First of all, he describes by giving contrast those who don't have God's Spirit. And I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open here for this. He gives the first contrast of those who are in the flesh and those who are in the Spirit. Let's read verse 5. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You know, the battle in our walk with God is in the mind. And you know, the battle in the sinner's heart begins in the mind. 
Because we, we live in a world where before there are actions and before there are words, there are thoughts. Thoughts enter into our minds and we have to take every thought captive to the authority of Jesus Christ. I believe the women's group on Thursday night has been studying a book. I don't know if they're finished with it now or not. Lies that women believe. Well, men believe lies too. It's easy for Satan to come in, especially in a world where we are so driven by our schedules and where we are so exhausted by the amount of activity we are involved in. It's easy to believe a lie. When you're driving down the road with a sub in your hand, well, you know... Satan can put things into your mind. Satan never gets tired. And he never runs out of ideas. He's always trying to get us to believe the lie. Because the battle begins in the mind. The Scripture tells us as God's people to, to not be conformed to the spirit of this world, but to be transformed by what? By the renewing of our minds. You know, just because we have a heart transformation and get saved, does not mean that everything is, is as it should be yet. Yes, we are saved, and if we were to die, we'd go to heaven. But if we're going to live in this world, we have developed some wrong ways of thinking. And so the Holy Spirit automatically begins to change some of those. He automatically begins to come in, and He begins to tell us whatever our, our former way of thinking is. You know, the Bible says this about this particular issue and activity and about this attitude. I want you to do it this way. And we have to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit because after all, what the Holy Spirit is trying to do is give us freedom from defeat. And unless we win the battle in the mind, as it says in verse 5, we're not going to have that victory, are we? But when we win the battle in the mind because of the power of the Holy Spirit, it's one of the first things we can have. First areas of victory that we can experience. He describes not only those who are in the flesh and those who are in the Spirit, but he uses another contrast found in verse 6. He uses the contrast of death and life. The extremes. He says in verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What does he mean when he says to be carnally minded? He means to be fleshly. To think from our own perspective of our fleshly desires. That's what he means when he says to be carnally minded. Or in other words, our life is driven, it is motivated by what we can do in the flesh. He said and when we live that way, the end result is death. But he says if we, will be, if we will be spiritually minded or motivated by the Spirit of God, we find the end of that is life and peace. Those who don't have God's Spirit are in the flesh. The end is death. But then verse 6 and 7, he describes another contrast. He calls it war with God and peace with God. He says because the carnal mind is enmity or against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. You know, one of the things we need to understand is that we can live our life according to the flesh, but what we're going to discover is that rather than finding the peace that people say you can have by getting exactly what you think you want, you find yourself at war with God. And that's not how we want to live, is it? There are so many people who have no clue. Satan has blinded their eyes to the fact that they are kicking against God's law every day and it gets so hard. And yet they're telling themselves, I'm getting what I want. I'm getting what I want. I'm getting what I want. No, you're getting war and confusion and heartache. But then there's one more contrast he uses, that of pleasing self and that of pleasing God. Because if you look in verse 8, he said, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If we are motivated by our fleshly desires, if we are living in the flesh, we are not going to please God. And let me say this, you will not ultimately please yourself if you live in your flesh. You will ultimately destroy yourself. 
is what the writer is saying. Because if we don't please God, what happens? We are judged by His law and found guilty. This is the first level of living. Those who don't have God's Spirit. But then there's another level of living. These are those who have God's Spirit. Let's begin in verse 9. But you are not in the flesh. Remember, he just described those who are in the flesh. He gave contrast. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God that dwells in you. He says, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You know, one of the things we need to understand is that whenever we get saved, we receive God's Holy Spirit. We don't just receive God's Holy Spirit when we are sanctified or when we are completely and totally surrendered at some point beyond, beyond being saved. We receive God's Spirit at the beginning. He says, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. But there are many people today who are content to say, well, I have God. But they kind of stay on a level where they are battling with the flesh. The spirit and the flesh are constantly battling. This is what he's describing here. I'm not trying to prove a doctrine here. I'm trying to let the scripture say what it says. But he's describing those who have God's spirit. Then in verse 11 he says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Again, this is us having the spirit. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The whole reference in verses 9 through 11 is we have God's Spirit. Thank God when we have His Spirit. If you have His Spirit, you should be in right relationship with God. But then He moves on to the third level of living. And I, you have to look at this, but I, I was so smitten by this when I saw it. And this is when the Spirit has you. When the Spirit has you. Verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. You know, when the, when the Spirit of Christ comes into us, when the Holy Spirit comes into us at salvation... He begins to make a transformation in leadership in our lives. We begin to turn things over to God and say, Lord, as the Lord says, I want to be in charge of this. Why does God want to be in charge? Folks, for the same reason that you want to drive your car and not your six-year-old. If you allow your six-year-old to drive the car, you have serious issues very shortly coming. <laughs> That's why your six-year-old gets to sit in the back and play with toys and watch movies and you can do the driving. You know, it's so much easier when we let God have control Amen. because He's more capable of doing what needs to be done and giving us the life that we've always longed for if we will allow the Spirit to have us Amen. and lead us. What does the Spirit lead us to? What does the Spirit lead us to? Well, we talked in verse 14, and you've seen it there. He leads us into relationship with God. For when the Spirit leads us, we are the sons of God. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and allow yourself to be obedient. Say, I will yield my members unto righteousness. And He will lead us into fellowship with the Heavenly Father every time. But He also leads us into freedom from bondage. Freedom from bondage. Look in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Daddy. When does a child fear? When they do not allow their daddy to lead them. Or their mother to lead them. I'm telling your daddy when he gets home and you're in trouble. I never told my dad no. That was foolish and it was also another word called suicide. <laughs> but what sets me free from bondage 
is when I allow the Holy Spirit, as it describes in verse 15, to lead me. And when He leads me, He leads me out of fear. What brings fear in our relationship with God? When we have stood up and said, Lord, you can't have this. And all of a sudden, the joy begins to evaporate. The love begins to grow cold. And fear raises its ugly black head in the midst of our walk with God. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, He leads us into freedom from bondage. He not only leads us into freedom from bondage, He leads us into adoption into God's family. Because the emphasis there, He says, but you've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Daddy, Father. You know, in, in, the, in the New Testament age, when the, this was written, it was an absolutely astounding, amazing thing when someone was adopted into a family. If you were adopted into a family, it wasn't just, yeah, you know, we got another baby from China. It wasn't anything like that. <coughs> it was, you were given all the freedoms and the rights and the privileges as an heir of that family. And you received a place in that Father's will. You received an inheritance from that family when it was time. You received all the blessings that the reputation of that family gave. Folks, when we're adopted into the family of Jesus Christ, we're adopted into an amazing family. Amen. We're adopted into a Father's family who has unlimited resources. Who has unlimited influence and reputation. Who has unlimited power. And the things that you and I are struggling with. He has the ability to bring us above and beyond those things. And to give us the victory that we are needing. What are we talking about this morning? Those whom the Spirit has. He gives freedom to. Hallelujah. But then... Not only does it give us adoption to God's family, but it gives us confidence in our faith. Look in verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You don't have to walk around saying, I hope I'm a child of God. You can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you belong to Abba. That you belong to Daddy. Amen. You belong to God. Why? Because when we allow the Spirit to have us and He works through us and does what He wants, there's a confidence that comes into a walk with God like that. That's right. It's natural. <laughs> I remember, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I, I got a plaque. And you've probably seen it before and I don't have it memorized. But it was about my father's name. It talked about the name that he gave me. It was all he had to give and I read that plaque, I have it, I believe it's hanging in my office. But when I think about my father, I'm very proud of him. I'm glad I can be. I know that's not always the case. But I received an earthly inheritance from a father who said, Son, I remember one time when I was caught in some sin, and it was bad for the age, and, and uh, my dad gave me the, we had a board of education meeting, and I got voted out. And, but I'll never forget, when the meeting was over, he fell down on his knees. As I'm still sitting there trying to feel my backside and tears rolling down my cheeks, and he fell down on his knees and he began to sob. And he said, Son, I didn't bring you into this world to serve the devil. I brought you into this world to serve Jesus. And this will take you down a pathway that will destroy your life and it will take you away from Jesus. It won't lead you toward. I thank God for a dad like that. I thank God for a father like that. And what it has done is that it has bred a confidence in me. I'm so blessed I can pick up the phone. And I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do it. I hope for another 29, 30 years. But I doubt it. And I can call my father and I call him pretty much every day. And I don't talk long, but I say, Dad, how you doing? I'm doing all right, son. How's it going at the church? He's always there. You know, we can pick up the phone and call our Heavenly Father anytime. And He's always going to have a positive word. He's always going to, have, going to give us confidence because that's what God does for His children. He allows us to live in confidence in our faith. 
What are we talking about this morning? We're talking about freedom found in Jesus Christ. But then, we find that the Holy Spirit, when He has us, He leads us to our inheritance from God. Look at verse 17. He says, if we're children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. Can you imagine being a joint heir? What does that mean? That means Jesus Christ gets His inheritance and we're going to be right beside Him and get ours too. Wow. I don't understand that. That one blows my theological doors off. But the Bible says it. Thank God I believe it this morning. If we will allow the Holy Spirit to have us, what He's going to lead us to is a richer and richer life in Jesus Christ. And someday, whenever we stand before God and Jesus Christ is honored and every knee bows and every tongue confesses that He is Lord, we're going to stand beside Him at some point and we're going to be called joint heirs by the Father. Hallelujah. What are we talking about? Freedom in Christ. When the Holy Spirit has us. But then also when the Holy Spirit has us, He gives us grace to go through the trials, Brother White. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. He said in verse 17 that we're going to be heirs if indeed we suffer with Him that we may also be glorified together. Folks, I don't know about you this morning, but I need grace to go through the trials. I don't know what the rest of this day holds, and I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I'm so glad I know that God is holding me and He's holding you in His hands, and there's grace to go through the trials, and whatever it is we're going to face, if the Spirit has control of us, and if He is leading, if He is directing us, we can find grace in those moments. Because our God is a God of freedom. He's a God of amazing grace. And then lastly, we shall receive glory. Because He said not only will we suffer with Him, but He said we may be glorified together. In verse 17. Folks, there's coming a day if we can just not allow the neon lights that are flickering around us at a rapid pace and in numerous locations to get our attention off of the Lord when we are going to receive the glory that Jesus receives. We're going to be glorified with Him. He will be Lord. We'll never be God's, but we will be allowed to be joint heirs and receive glory in the presence of Christ. I don't understand that, but I'm so thankful that it's there. Amen. Because, folks, we serve a God. If we will allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in our hearts and lives, He will lead us into freedom like we've never experienced before. Next week, we're going to deal with two more freedoms. But I just want to share with you this morning in closing that you can have freedom from judgment, and that you can have a freedom that the world knows nothing about. The world can't condemn you. The world can't hold you down. The world can't tell you that you can have no victory. Because we have a freedom from judgment and we have a freedom from defeat. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God through Jesus Christ. You know what I kind of feel like this message has been this morning? It's kind of been a, not necessarily so much even a practical message. We haven't been talking about issues that I know you're going through, but we've just kind of been going through the Word and taking big chunks of steak and saying, who wants some? Because that's what this is. Are you in bondage this morning? You don't have to live that way. Can you say amen? amen. amen. You don't have to live... A life where you profess the name of Jesus Christ and walk around with a ball and chain on your experience. Amen. And I'm not talking about your spouse. You can serve God and have freedom in the Spirit. And that is what God is calling us to. That is what I'm crying out for. That's what we all need. Do you know that this is very attractive to the world? When they, what happens when we're really free? We have a smile on our face. 
We have a spring in our step that the world can see from time to time. And they sometimes, the bold ones say, you know what, I wish I had what you've got. I don't know what it is, but I sure would like to kind of figure that out. It's a wonderful thing. It's a real blessing when people come up to you and say, and I've heard of it happening many times, how is it that when things go wrong, you react different than me? I, I blow up and cuss and quit my job. And What's the difference in you? Is it some kind of image, religious image, that I'm going to grit, grit my teeth and grin? I'm okay. No, it's freedom. It's real spiritual freedom that was bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ on a horrific cross, dying a terrible death, so that we could live a wonderful life. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, regardless of how anyone feels here in this building today, the truth has been shared from your word. It's not my truth, it's your truth. And Lord, it stands eternal. And it stands ever powerful. It's just as powerful today as the day when it was first penned by the Apostle Paul. Because Lord, you have called us to freedom in Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would help every one of our people to experience this freedom. Not that we've conjured up and tried to make out of a man's doctrine, but the Word of God says is available to every child of God. So Lord, I pray this week that if there's one who's struggling with bondage, that you will gently lead them, Lord, to the cross of freedom. Where the Holy Spirit can begin to have His way, can begin to work. We know, Lord, that freedom doesn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight in the American Revolution. It took years. But, Lord, we know that when someone surrenders, you can give freedom in an instant because your blood has already bought it. The victory's already been won. We just have to claim it by surrendering to you. So, Father, we thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you for your spirit. And I pray that you will help us, Lord, to live this week in the spirit of freedom found in Christ. Not apologetically, not cautiously, but with abandon and with excitement because we are free in Christ. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said a hearty Amen. Amen. God bless you for coming. You are dismissed.